Hi, welcome. Thanks very much for joining me. My name is Nicole Hamilton. I'm a physiotherapist with a special interest in managing hip pathology. What I'd like to share with you today in this short lecture are the contributing factors to anterior hip pain and load in our patients. And the patients that I'm talking about are those that have been diagnosed with either FAI or label tear. So we all know that there are a certain group of patients with anterior hip impingement signs that do very well with arthroscopic surgery to address their structural morphology. And we do know that when a patient's diagnosed with FAI, that's a combination of structural changes evident on their X-ray, so CAM or pincer morphology evident on their X-ray, plus symptomatic hip pain related to activity, so pain with twisting the hip or getting in and out of a chair, as well as positive tests, orthopedic or uh, physiotherapy tests on examination, such as the hip quadrant or scour test. So if a patient has hip-related signs evident in your exam, as well as hip symptoms throughout their daily life, as well as CAM or pincer morphology evident on X-ray, these three things together can be known as FAI or called FAI. So there are a certain group of patients within this, uh, within this diagnosis that may do quite well following their hip arthroscopy surgery to address the structural changes that are evident. However, we also know that there are quite a few people out there, 50% of sporting males up to, uh, that have CAM morphology evident on their X-ray that are completely asymptomatic. So certainly the morphology is not the whole picture, it's just a piece of the picture. Uh, and we also know that there are a group of patients that present with labral pathology or painful labral tear that are symptomatic that don't have CAM or pincer morphology. So clearly the morphology is only just a piece of the picture and what I'd like to explore now are just what else can be contributing to anterior hip load outside the structural changes. So before I cover some of the contributing factors to anterior hip pain and overload or wear in our patients, uh, what I'd like to explore is just a very quick uh, review of biomechanics and anatomy of the hip joint. And we all know that uh, from the research and in our patients that anterior superior labral tears are by far the most common tear that you'll see. And we also know that the anterior superior margin of the hip joint is a little bit more vulnerable. The reason being is if you look at the shape of the acetabulum, so the bird's eye view of the acetabulum, see that the posterior part of the hip joint offers a lot of bony restraint for the femoral head. Whereas the anterior part of the hip joint has less bony restraint offered by the acetabulum, simply because the acetabulum tends to face in the forward direction. And that does vary from patient to patient, of course. But if there is any subtle instability in the hip joint, it will tend to be more commonly in the anterior direction. And there can be up to four millimetres of femoral head translation within the acetabulum in, in the normal population. We also know that the roof and the posterior wall of the acetabulum are designed to take our weight bearing load, which is perfect because when we're walking, our hip lands in a certain degree of hip flexion and the ground reaction force up through the foot and into the femur tends to land at the back wall of the acetabulum, the posterior wall of the acetabulum. So that's what first takes our weight bearing load as we're walking or running. Then as we come through stance phase or even when we're standing, the ground reaction force through the femur tends to be in the vertical direction, which means the, the roof of the acetabulum is what takes our weight bearing load. So that's normal bony reactions and normal biomechanics around the hip joint. So when I see in my clinic patients with anterior hip pain or anterior hip impingement signs, I, I tend to see two groups of people. Now, I, I don't like to say uh, let's pigeonhole patients into two groups because, of course, there's always going to be one patient that doesn't fit either of those groups well and it becomes a bit of a grey area or messy. But for the simplicity of this short lecture today, I'll say that there tends to be two ends of the spectrum that I see. Uh, the first group with anterior hip impingement signs, and this is probably the most common, uh, is the group that have compressive anterior hip load, which is essentially related to flexion-based activities uh, or flexion-based sports. Now this happens when the femoral head, uh, femoral head neck junction abuts against that anterior superior margin of the acetabulum and over a period of time creates compressive load um, on the acetabular labrum and can contribute to impingement type pain or tear. 
Now, if these patients have any structural problems, they tend to be your CAM group and sometimes your pincer group. So if there is a structural problem or a structural change, then that, that tends to be in this particular bucket. Uh, the activities and sports that these patients like to do are normally related to flexion, so cycling or change of direction sports and running or a lot of kicking related sports that takes the hip up into flexion and internal rotation, which creates that cumulative load of compression on the anterior hip joint. This particular group often experience their symptoms after periods of hip flexion. So they may not be painful when they sit, but they often get painful after a period of sitting when they go to get up out of their chair or related to their sports um, or activities in that way. So they'll often have uh, activity related pain with their sports. And this group typically has very poor motor control of the pelvis on the hip. Uh, so what we do tend to see is a weakness or poor control or poor function of the gluteal system. And this commonly can contribute to uh, hypertonicity or overworking of other muscles such as hamstrings, TFL and piriformis. So they often have a very poor um, bending pattern through the hip, uh, which can overload other structures such as their lumbar spine or their SI joint. So when we're looking at treatment options for patients that have compressive load onto the anterior hip, uh, the first thing that we need to obviously try and do with these uh, group of patients is give them advice on their activity and modifying their activity. So if they are sitting for any length of time to elevate the hips higher than their knees, to avoid a cumulative load of lots of sitting throughout the day, so if they can get a sit-stand desk just to take some of the pressure off, putting a wedge cushion in their calf, for example. And the other part of their treatment, of course, is then providing them with a, a functional graded strengthening program targeting pelvis on hip control and also trunk control. So that's one group covered, um, the group that have anterior hip impingement type pain as a result of excessive compressive load into the anterior superior margin of the hip joint. And that may be a result of structural problems, but also a result of motor control issues and possibly a result of the activities that they're choosing to do. Now, of course, there's always the other group that I see at, at the other end of the spectrum that I think needs addressing. Uh, and that's the group that tends to have excessive anterior translation of the femoral head or habitual postures that lend itself to weight bearing load on that anterior superior margin in hip extension related activities. So uh, this particular group of people, uh, it, patients that we see, if they are going to have any structural problems, it'll tend to be either dysplasia or sometimes um, uh, pincer based morphology around the acetabulum. Um, the activities that this group tend to be involved with are more commonly your hypermobile group, so often your dancers, your gymnasts, sometimes your runners and your swimmers. Uh, the symptoms that they tend to get in their hip are groin related symptoms or hip pain related to standing, walking, running, being upright and weight bearing into hip extension. So we can see from the particular picture on the slide there that uh, if we're thinking that the roof of the acetabulum is designed to take our weight bearing load, then that girl standing with her hip in hyperextension essentially means that the ground reaction force through the femur will tend to be then weight bearing on that very acetabular rim, so right on the edge, she's probably weight bearing on her labrum. Uh, so if this particular girl had had a hip arthroscopy, uh, you can imagine that within three to six months time, she's gonna have some ongoing symptoms if she continues to weight bear on her newly repaired or resected labrum. Uh, so her outcome won't be so good unless we educate her on the best way of standing to optimise the load through the roof of the acetabulum rather than that anterior superior margin of the acetabulum. You can also imagine that if this girl were given some hip flexor stretches to do, so if she was asked to stretch out her iliozoas, uh, probably not such a great outcome. She does have quite a lot of hip extension available there already. Um, and this particular patient does require their iliozoas to be part of the dynamic restraint that holds or supports the femoral head within the acetabulum. So if we start to excessively stretch that, or worst case scenario, send them to a surgeon and resect that, uh, in this particular patient, her outcomes are not necessarily gonna be so great. So this is the other end of the spectrum that I tend to see. This group can tend to have hypermobile tendencies, either global hypermobility as a result of a connective tissue disorder, or sometimes just focal laxity as a result of habitual habits throughout their life uh, that create that accumulative effect of excessive hip extension in weight bearing. So this particular group, when we look at their motor control, will tend to have poor stability of the femoral head 
within the acetabulum, which essentially means that they need to start a targeted uh, endurance-based program for their uh, rotator cuff of the hip. So this is a group that do quite well with rotator cuff-based exercises to stabilise the femoral head within the acetabulum, as well as then looking at pelvis on hip control um, uh, throughout their activities of daily living to, to lead them back into sports. So they do need both uh, parts of their motor control addressed, their uh, femoral head within their acetabulum and also the pelvis on hip. And if we do look at some of the other research uh, that's available looking at the characteristic impairments in patients that have undergone hip arthroscopy for a label tear, uh, there's a nice piece of research available. At, and the group that they've included, 40% um, of them did not have FAI. So they did not have pincer morphology or CAM morphology. Uh, they just had um, symptomatic label tear that underwent uh, arthroscopic surgery and they were followed up 12 to 24 months later. Uh, and what they did find in this piece of research that this group did have the tendency to increased hip extension range of movement available. So this is your kind of hypermobile end that tend to weight bear um, habitually on the acetabular rim. Um, and so they had more hip extension range of movement, which is again, just uh, another piece of evidence to support that we probably shouldn't be stretching the hip flexors in this particular patient population. Uh, they don't need more hip extension range of movement. So the other key piece of information that came out of this research, which supports other research that's been published, is that this particular patient population have significant deficits in their strength around the hip and also deficits in functional capacity around the hip. So the capacity to get in and out of a chair or hop or do anything dynamic on one leg. So with this, uh, our physiotherapy uh, treatment really needs to be targeting uh, strength around the hip joint, uh, as well as in this particular patient group, giving them advice and education on how to reduce their anterior hip load in standing. So that might be taking them to the mirror, uh, helping them adjust their posture so that they know throughout their daily life that they're not gonna be loading onto that anterior superior margin of the acetabulum, so that's education. Um, and then modifying their standing and walking posture in their daily life, maybe looking at their running technique, seeing if we can take the trunk a little bit more forward to allow a little bit more hip, hip flexion when they foot strike. Uh, and then, like I said, creating a functional targeted strengthening program, not just for the pelvis on hip in this group, but also uh, some more targeted exercises, looking at the rotator cuff control of the femoral head within the acetabulum. Uh, and that group uh, are the group that tend to need that kind of inner stability work uh, more than the compressive group. So as you can see, I've tried to touch on just a few of the contributing factors to anterior hip load. And the way I consider uh, my anterior hip impingement patients uh, is it's more like a wheel alignment problem than a car accident. So it's not like your ACL or snapped Achilles tendon or a fracture. It's a, often a gradual uh, onset of symptoms that occur slowly over a period of time due to a wheel alignment issue that's occurring, uh, that's contributing to anterior hip load or wear at that anterior superior margin of the acetabulum. And part of our job is to figure out why that's happening. Now, of course, uh, like the overflowing bucket, there can be a few things that are contributing to the patient's uh, symptoms. One of them is a structural problem, such as CAM or pincer morphology, or maybe even dysplasia. Uh, but we all know that there are plenty of people out there with these structural problems that are completely asymptomatic. So I don't think it's the whole bucket or the whole picture, it's just a piece of it. Then there are other contributing factors that we can see in our patients are deficits evident in strength or motor control or functional control around the hip, pelvis or trunk. Uh, the other thing that might be contributing to their bucket overload are just what they're doing in their activities of daily living. So are they a crossfitter that's insistent on going into a deep, deep squat uh, in conjunction with uh, CAM or pincer morphology, which is just adding to excessive compressive load uh, throughout their activities of daily living? Or are they sitting for 12 hours a day? Do we need to address that? So their, their activities of daily living may also be a contributing factor that we need to educate them on. Uh, the final thing that, of course, it's always going to potentially add to someone's uh, bucket overload or add to their big picture uh, are things like uh, chronic pain or neural sensitization that may need a uh, pain education approach in order to help them manage their symptoms. So all of these things need to be looked at and addressed uh, in the anterior hip pain group.
So when a patient presents to me with anterior hip pain that's a result of an impingement type problem, either compressive or an extension based overload onto the anterior superior margin of the acetabulum, I'm really asking myself the question, why has this patient developed these symptoms? Uh, I'm, not, I'm less interested in what the problem is and I'm more interested in why they've got it. And then the question I then ask myself is how can I address each of these contributing factors individually in my patient in order to optimise their outcome and improve their symptoms? Uh, which essentially means that a blanket recipe protocol for anterior hip impingement type pain um, is a pretty good, difficult thing to come by because there are so many other contributing factors that need to be tailored to a patient's uh, physiotherapy intervention. So I really hope that you've enjoyed today's short lecture on anterior hip impingement and some of the contributing factors that I look at in my own hip patients that present to me with anterior hip impingement pain. Of course, I have my one day hip workshop that's available in Australia, and I also have some online resources available for therapists on my website. Thanks very much for joining me.